Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 478 of Constructive Criticism. I'm your host, EZ, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Abe the Beanie Stein. I don't appreciate being called the Beanie. I'm I'm a whole man, and <laughs> the fact that I wear a beanie sometimes when it's cold. Hey, you're thinking about those beanies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mason learns about the microwave Clark. I uh, recently moved into a new place, everyone, and I uh, bought a new microwave, and it's very efficient compared to my old rundown one. Was it like one that you had like turned the knob or something previously? It, it was like from the early nineties. Okay. Okay. It was old. You know, it took a little bit longer to heat things up. This one, a little bit more efficient. We learned that's okay. We're always improving. We didn't burn the house down. <laughs> if you want to hear stories about microwaves, you know you can join the Patreon, become a patron of five dollars or more, get access to the live shows, history. Uh, actually, you know I think everybody gets early access these days uh, that on the Patreon. So head on over to Patreon.com/slash/ccmtg. You get access to live shows Mondays at eight p.m. Eastern time, where uh, you can hear you can hear us talk about beanies and. Uh, <laughs> Hot pockets and microwaves this week. It was, it was uh, we hadn't seen each other in a while. It's not usually that uh, that long and fun, but just wanted to throw it out there. We won't we won't be talking about microwaves much more on this podcast because this week is an episode that I wanted to do for a long time. I um, mean, it's something that come came up a lot around um, RC San Diego when. I was doing coaching with quite a few people again um, for the first time in a long time. And that was, you know, talking about like the value in, in, in fundamentals and being what I, you know, blatantly stole from smash being hashtag team fundies um, and how that applies to magic and what it kind of means differently for this game. And I'm, I'm really stoked to talk about it before we do. The point of the show is always improving. We always want to be doing what we can to be better. And, you know, it's it's a process. And I, I really loved some stuff said in the Discord this week about it being a process. And it was certainly a process for me this week. And so I'm going to go first. I, in the last year, have been really focused on... Really, it's been the last, like, eight months. Really focused on kind of changing my attitude towards things. Uh, and my mental health and I really saw the fruits of my labor kind of this weekend Uh, Friday I was laid off for the third time in a year from a startup that I really loved and it's a it's a really hard loss to deal with when you pour your heart and soul into something like a startup and they just don't have money anymore like the, the funding doesn't come in uh you know the the VCs aren't paying for those who don't know startups work And it's kind of all taken out from under you. And I had a really good night Friday night after it happened. Uh, Mason texted me. I think I was in pretty good spirits. And Saturday morning I woke up defeated. And I'm I'm in bed at at some point uh, feeling really defeated. I just had missed an RCQ that I had planned on playing. And I was like, what am I doing? Like, and I just got out of bed. Went downstairs, talked to my wife about work, talked to my wife about, you know, magic, and I was sad that I missed this RCQ. And, you know, the the always improving moment for me is, like, realizing that that moment was okay. That it's okay to have those moments where you feel defeated, where you feel sad. But to, I don't know, for me, where I'm at... Uh, have a moment to just say, okay, now it's now it's time to move on. I was a stay-at-home dad today. I applied for some awesome jobs. I got some magic practice in. Um, I wrote show notes for the show. Um, you know, it was a successful day. And I think that, you know, while you, maybe the thing that you're going through isn't the same as getting laid off from your job, uh, one thing to think about with always improving is that it's not – every single day is better than the last one because we're not all our best every single day but it's it's about a consistent attempt to be better than you were and to be improving so mason what about you 
Uh, I wanted to quickly say, sorry, I was I had something caught on my throat. Uh, I wanted to quickly say I agree, Spencer, and it's important to you know be kind to yourself if you're doing always improving. I think sometimes players get really frustrated when you haven't made strides in a while and they feel like they plateau or something where they, you know, maybe they slack for a couple of weeks. And just because you didn't succeed now doesn't mean you won't succeed long-term. And just because you maybe didn't, you know, more on top of things this week doesn't mean you're, you're doomed long-term the best time to get back on the horses right now. Anyways, my always improving moment really comes uh, for practicing from the Lorcana 5k invitational I'm playing at apex gaming. Uh, I've been working with a couple of people for that and really getting into the nitty gritty and understanding the context of things and why they matter so much in that game. And to, to leak a little, I guess, for that event. So if you're one of those other 15 invited players, you'll get a little information. But basically, there are some things that translate really well one-to-one for Magic, as they do with all card games, right? Like two-for-ones and understanding, like positioning and playing on board wipes, all that sort of stuff matters. But uh, a thing that... I've really noticed is that stats matter a lot in Lorcana because it's still a very new game. And sometimes just having a big body is nice in these sort of early game turns of the game where maybe you wouldn't think about playing, you know, a three mana four, four in magic, but I'm interested in Lorcana because damage sticks in the game plays differently. And the always improving moment is making sure to put aside heuristics and actually be thinking about things and, not ruling anything out because you know traditionally it's not that way right i want to be actually learning from it and a thing i've been saying a lot recently is heuristics are the deaths of tournaments heuristics are things you should lean on when you don't know where your time constraints but you need to like actually come to conclusions and learn about things and i applied that to my practice and i think it's really helpful and hopefully put me in a better position for that event can i ask you a question yeah did you did you play like real early hearthstone yeah, I, I've played uh, a lot of card games. Um, okay, but yes, OG so you, Hearthstone. You, I played a bunch. You, you played. You've played your chill. Your chill win Yetis. Then, yeah, yeah. I would say this card is like the one I'm thinking of particularly is like the chill win Yeti equivalent. But the difference is that the chill win Yeti wasn't also a mana, which had like made this card even better. Like, imagine chill win Yeti could also like go into your gemstone. Okay. You know what I mean? Cool. And like it's like oh it's also like ramping growth or whatever right like th- that is sort of what's happening there and I, I think it's it is really good and like it is a, an important I guess like pass less and draw right like we've seen these sort of things be strong before and we've seen in other card games too if you play one piece the four mana six Ks are very strong and playable same sort of idea so just to think about awesome hey. Yeah, um, Miles improving this week uh, actually came from the store championship where I split the finals with a friend of mine after not really having a chance to play this limited format much uh, just because of work and not being able to devote the time to that and also modern RSQ season. So really, I had let's see, I'd done a lot of work by listening to drafting archetypes to just kind of keep up on things and, uh, and make sure I knew where it was. And that did help me come, uh, come the top eight. But Something I did before we got our packs into deck building was I just like went around. There's like five of us, uh, my friends who were there, um, including myself. And it was a pretty small, you know, uh, I guess reasonably intense sort of like a five round sealed event. But I just asked them, like, you know, hey, what is it you're looking for in your build? How's the format slanted? Going over, you know, what are cards that I really shouldn't ignore? And then even once build was done, going over, like, hey, how would you build my sealed pool for like, you know, four times over and having like four people just look at it and talk over, okay, you know, maybe if your opponent's deck is like this, you know, this is how you should position it. You know, maybe these are cyborg cards worth considering, not worth considering. And thanks to not only like integrating that information, but also my own evaluation of things. I had like a pretty mediocre pool. Uh, honestly, I had like some game plans, but like didn't have a lot of, you know, I didn't have any cards that were giving me free wins. Didn't have uh, any of maybe some of the more premium cards in the set but because i understood the strengths of my deck and also like could piece together the play patterns of how things might play out thanks to the information i had i was able to convert that into making into the top eight and getting to draft and ultimately um you know using those same lessons i had learned from talking to them about the draft format as well and listening to to sam black into uh you know my second draft of the format ever you know splitting the finals and taking home half the credit and half a promo. So, uh, yeah, really it was just taking the time to be, you know, humble about it and taking in the feedback, even though, you know, I, I think I'm one of the better players in like in my play group, even which is quite strong, 
but being like, yeah, I don't know what the draft format is like or what the limited format is like. And you guys have played it a lot. Um, taking the time to listen uh, to that and then like integrate it was really, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to do. And something where I know that in the past I maybe have just gone, Oh, you know, like I know what I'm doing is limited, you know, like not, not taking time to evaluate what is exactly different about that format. You know, it, it's, I really glad that you brought this up. There was a, a tweet I didn't like very much that happened this week that was like making fun of coaching and MTG again, because that happens every week and a half. And it was really funny because of like, they're like, you know, I've never gone to a pro tour, but like, you know, I won eight, I eight ACQ or whatever number of RCQs or something. And I was, I was thinking to myself reading this tweet. I was like, I, I find it interesting the level that players will get to where they think that they're good enough to do it either on their own or where they they no longer think the people that aren't directly with them or that are, you know, leaps and bounds better than them have valuable advice, right? Whereas if you talk, like we've had multiple guests on where they talk about where they will get advice from people a lot worse than them because they have context. Because the, the context and the opportunities to learn are important. I really appreciate that you took that opportunity to learn and share it with the listeners. Yeah, and it paid off too. You, especially with things that are like, you know, specific formats and stuff, you're gonna learn so much from talking to people who actually, you know, know the ins and outs of it and being able to like take their perspectives and work them in with your own, especially if you don't necessarily have the strongest yourself. So I was, I was really grateful for that and uh, it worked out well for me. All right. Uh, we have no patron shout outs this week, but we do just wanna mention uh, patreon.com slash CCMTG. It is the uh, you know, the best way to support the show is always leave those reviews, those comments, engaging with the show and sharing it with your friends. But, you know, if you have the financial means, the show will always be free, but it's greatly appreciated. No housekeeping this week. We're going to dive right into the training grounds, which is uh, Team Fundies in MTG. So what is Team Fundies? This is this is actually something behind the scenes that uh, Abe really wanted me to define when I came up with this topic. It, why was that? I just want to ask before I say what it is. Why was that important to you? So I think that there's something that gets said a lot in Magic, and it's something where it's like, oh, you know, you need to work on your technical play. You need to work on, you know, these things. We say these words a lot, and it can be something where you don't even necessarily know. And I know when I first was told that, uh, you know, a long time ago, of like, you know, work on your technical play, and everything else will come. It's like, what does that even mean? What is my technical play exactly and what are the fundamental skills i should be working on if that's what is going to be important to building my foundation and so you know i think that a lot of times people just kind of hear it and they're like maybe they get generic advice i know stuff that i've been told or have told people masses maybe go play more limited and you know do more sealed deck building and games that are more about combat or play more you know of this kind of deck or that kind of deck and it's like well what am i supposed to be learning exactly and i think that that's really important uh, for an episode like this to, to define so that people come out of it knowing, you know, where is it that my fundamental skills are and what, what's going to be those building blocks that I should be working on and checking in on to make sure that I'm, you know, building, building a sound structure for myself as a player. I love it. So for me, going to this episode and thinking about this and, and pitching it, I think that just like being a reasonable deck gamer, being Team Fundies is this this kind of like promise to yourself and team fundies just means that you're a player that believes in focusing on fundamentals and magic can, takes you further than most would expect. Uh, and that, uh, and that, uh, you, when you have to strive to have good fundamentals, it's, it's a constant process. Mason, we've already said the word fundamentals, you know, all these times we haven't said what they are. What are fundamentals? Yeah. I think sort of the three core fundamentals in magic, are attacking and blocking mulligan and resource management. There's a lot more that goes into them. That's sort of the sound bite and uh, especially attacking and blocking uh, in modern magic creatures are a big part of the game and they play to the battlefield. And I don't care if you play a control deck or an aggro deck, you're going to have to engage with attacking and blocking and games are won and lost on the back of attacks and blocks. Yeah, I, and what's what's funny is like I think a lot of people can hear something like this and think like, oh, well, this doesn't matter for me, and here's why because I'm a this gamer or I'm a this gamer. And the truth is, like, did you miss uh, an attack with your man land? 
that was free for a turn because you were holding a mana that didn't matter? Because then you messed up on two of these fundamentals. Did you mulligan incorrectly so that you uh, didn't have an attack on turn two that you could have had easily in your deck? Because that messed up on two of these also. And and they they kind of when they when you said that like they're the three pieces here, I think that they're so deep too for other compared to like other things that you can do in magic. And we we've talked about mulligan and ad nauseum on the show over the last few months, right? And we've talked about the Mason, you've mentioned attacking the blocking you know, 40 times as something, I mean, you even mentioned it as one of your always improving segments, I think in the last two months, the, mm-hmm. these things are, they're deep and people think once they get the basics down, that's it. Now I move on to, as Mabe said, more technical things and I don't have to come back to these things. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's really important to, and this is something I was thinking about when, um, when I was thinking about this show in particular, is there something that's like a common thread through all of the players who I've known who just like players who, especially from like the SG tour, people would be like, Oh, they just like get it. They seem like they're really good. They play a lot of different decks and they are, they're always winning is that they always, and myself included would feel like, Oh, in those games where things get kind of weird and they break down, like in those games, I feel like I'm navigating them really well. And that helps a lot. And I, they really enjoy those games. And I think that things like that, are the exact kind of reason why fundamentals are so important and where they really come to be, right? Is that not only are they, right, are you able to know right on a bigger picture in a format, you know, why I'm playing my deck, how I want the games to play out, but when things aren't going that way, you're still able to reason out and make the right decisions. And like, you know, that really does come down to what are the game actions you take every turn? How are you managing the resources you have available to you? You know, and how are you interacting with the opponent on the bare bones level of combat? So I think all of those are like really, if you had to make a pyramid of what, of what they were, the three foundations, that would be like, you know, I, I think that's spot on. One, one thing I bring up a lot in coaching, and this is like, if you ever do coach with me, when we first meet, I think I ask you is how good do you think you are in attacking and blocking with a little scale I have? And we'll get to things like resource management or understanding your role. And I'll ask you and I'll say, how good are you when you first pick up a deck? Right. And what I'm really getting at is how good are you at that skill versus how much have you learned the context for the decks that you engage with? And I think what Abe is sort of saying, and I also agree with, is that like the great players and the really good players are the ones who understand magic and don't and not and not just understand their deck and how their deck interacts with that. Right. When the game breaks down from the non-normal and you're deviating, you understand what you're supposed to be doing and not what things are supposed to look like. And that's why you'll see someone like Nathan Storyer navigate his way out of this really weird game, and maybe someone who is really good at modern might lose it in the matchup because Nathan understands magic at its core level, and that person understood the matchup at the core level. And the matchup thing can be helpful, but understanding magic proper is going to really save you when games get weird or when you're new to picking up decks or switching decks all the time. Players who can't really switch decks typically have an issue with not understanding magic at its core fundamental level, which is what we're going to talk about today. How can focusing on the fundamentals help you kind of achieve your goals? We've talked a lot about goal setting on the show. Like, it, you know, Mason got a the point that I was going to bring up on the show about like modern being a format that rewards magic knowledge and rewards really diving into it, right? But you'll see players go play nothing but cube drafts for 20 weekends in a row, immediately spike an RCQ in modern and then move on with their lives. Like, is this the reason why, like what, what's happening here? I mean, I think that when you think about how do fundamentals help you like reach your goal of improving, right? When you have really sound fundamentals and what I think of when it comes to really sound fundamentals is you will be eliminating as many unforced errors from your game as possible, right? You'll look at a board state or you look at a hand and you'll look at a, you'll look at a game that you're playing. And instead of making the wrong decision or thinking it was about the wrong thing or missing something that was, you know, obviously available to you as an advantage, you start to cut out all of those opportunities for leaks. And when you don't have those leaks, it actually builds a stronger foundation for you to learn and to build on for, let's say that next skill of, oh, well, did I lose that game because I didn't evaluate if I should have been the aggressor or not well enough, you know, or did I lose that game because maybe I, you know, should have attacked on this turn and then I wound up three points short, three points short of lethal, like five turns down the line, you know, 
if you're making all those kinds of decisions, it's not like, oh, I just didn't play the right spell and therefore I died. Uh, or like I kept a bad hand and therefore I barely got to play the game. If you're avoiding those things, the quality of the games that you play goes up. And also the opportunities you have to simply be in the best spot possible in the games you're playing, right? And and leverage that experience into more and more knowledge or into, you know, focusing on different areas. You you patch up a lot of holes that might make it more difficult. And you also make sure that at the base level, you get to stop asking yourself the question so much of, did I make a really basic mistake? You know, you're not thinking about process, cognitively processing that level of the game because it's something you do so much of, yeah, I know that attacking this creature or that creature is the right thing to do, you know, in, in this board state. Or I know what can happen at the end of this combat if I make this attack. And when you're doing those things, um, you know, it's, it frees up a lot of your mental energy to think about other, other pieces of the game. And I think that all of it really spir- spirals upward. Yeah, I think actually a perfect example of Spencer's question is Abe's story from Always Improving. Abe has a strong core fundamental understanding of the game, doesn't need to think about a lot of things when it comes to building his sealed deck, but doesn't know the context of Woe Limited and is able to get the download from his friends. And then, you know, from there, you know, sideboard his deck accordingly, understand where his card's supposed to line up, know what he's supposed to do, get to draft, and then, you know, use that and understand and go. And if Abe didn't have a core understanding uh, or strong core understanding of fundamentals, he might still make it, but it would be, you know, maybe more surprising or less likely if he ran the tournament back a hundred times, right? And I think that is a big thing across all the formats. And modern really has a lot of trip up stuff where there's so many cards, so many things interact that way. But even standard or pioneer, you know, it wouldn't be shocking to me if Abe's story was I played pioneer and I didn't have the mono green cards and my friend lent me the stack and gave me the rundown and I won, or I didn't have standard cards and my friend gave me the Esper Legend stack and gave me the rundown and I won. Having a strong fundamental understanding of the game at the base level lets you succeed and do those things. And it's why it's the building blocks of magic. And if you don't have good really attacking and blocking and mulliganing and also sideboarding. But regardless, those things, like if you can't do that, it everything else doesn't really matter as much because you're built on such a bad foundation that your house will crumble. Are there decks, formats, strategies that, you know, as a listener, I could say like, this, this is going to help me build my fundamentals or things that I could do uh, as, as a player? It, I mean, personally... I've heard and, and also given the advice a lot that if you're someone who feels like you need to work on attacking and blocking and generally playing draft or playing sealed is a very good way to get a lot more at bats with that. You know, it's really about evaluating because right? because combat is usually about evaluating, okay, is my creature going to attack profitably into this creature? Do they have a profitable block? You know, do I want to exchange the resource of this creature or this removal spell or this, you know, do I want to use my mana doing this this turn, or is something else more important? And I think all of those are really at play in the lower power games to a higher extent. I also think that there are some decks in Pioneer that are really good for this too. I think Red Black Midrange and Pioneer is a pretty classic you know, example of all of your cards are good enough, um, but all you need to make sure you're taking the right resource exchanges. And if you're not making the good attacks and the good blocks, or you're not keeping the right kinds of hands the format will really punish you. And I think that there's a reason, and we say it a lot, like there's a reason that Misplaced Ginger wins a lot with Red Black and Red Black is incredibly high play rate. And he consistently uh, puts up amazing results with the deck and uh, like to a degree that others don't. And it's because he really understands what those good fundamental plays and keeps and, you know, decisions are. And there's a lot of opportunity there to be, you know, even if you're making the wrong ones, learning you're making the wrong ones because you do have to make those decisions over and over again. Um, when the card, when your card power level is lower, and you can't just lean into something like, like I mean, like modern, for example, there's a lot of games where maybe you just run away with it because you turn one grief scam your opponent, or you, uh, you know, you have two beanstalks and now you're just drawing like three or four extra cards. It doesn't really matter at a certain point. You're so far ahead. And you have so many cards that are forgiving that you might not learn or see, get the feedback immediately that the decision you made earlier was, you know, not, not as good for you. And things are so different than maybe fundamental magic is that it can be hard. But I think that the lower power of the format you're playing, the more opportunity you have for those, those kinds of combat based games. 
and the more that your decisions really wind up mattering and compounding over time. And I think those tend to lean towards being the best ones to be, you know, training grounds for, for this kind of, uh, this kind of skill. I echo everything you just said, and I'm just going to rattle off some, some of my thoughts that I do actually believe that there are formats and decks are even archetypes that really help with this. I think like sometimes when I go back to fundamentals, I change what, depending on what I'm practicing, I'll change the deck I'm playing or the format that I'm playing. Um, we, we've already mentioned attacking or blocking for limited, but uh, in resource management and understanding resources, modern is actually a really great one to try to help you understand resource management right now. Uh, if you're trying to understand Mola, getting modern trait for that. Uh, if you're trying to understand uh, attacking and blocking, and you're just like, I really just don't want to draft. The, fun fact: there's a lot of attacking and blocking in standard right now. And honestly, like the green black and the deck in standard is also a great one if you're just trying to like understand resource management. You're trying, you have to make good mulligans because you have to be able to apply pressure on these things on these turns and. That one, I was going to mention Red Black, but you kind of stole my thunder on that. But like the specific clip of on our show when when Derek talked about why are you casting Thoughtseize is like a fundamental question that should be listened to and heard as you're thinking about both the context of your deck and your and the format and like what the what role the card is serving in your deck and it is a resource that you are choosing to like you are both choosing to use it for life. You're choosing to use it for the the card itself, and uh, I thought it was really poignant. Mason, any thoughts that you have on any of this? Yeah, the, the one thing I will add is is that uh, I often tell people because l- let's be honest, not everyone enjoys limited or they find the act of drafting really anxiety inducing, and you're wanting to work on specifically attacking and blocking. I think specifically mono white in explorer, I believe, is the pioneer knockoff on arena's name. Um, but that deck, you can build it. And you can just jam infinite games and you're not going to lose anything and you can just practice. And all you can focus on is like, okay, what are my attacks here? And yeah, you have some games you run away with it, but there are lots of matchups where you have to get down to attacking and blocking and figure out how to attack through stalled board states. You know, if you find yourself, you're playing games and you're only winning, you draw value lieutenant type stuff, you're probably not pushing enough. So while I agree with everything these guys said, uh, that was just one that I wanted to highlight as a great way to sort of get infinity games not lose any money and just keep going going and going yeah i also want to say that you don't have to right you don't have to get this experience by you know going out to your lgs or going on arena and drafting if you have a single person who you play magic with regularly especially someone who also wants to improve at this skill you can just play games of like you know mono white mirrors and just talk out loud about okay is this attack good what is and then be like okay i'm attacking with this creature what's the best block you have you know what does that look like just talk through every permutation of combat and if you really want to grind out attacking and blocking like there was an old i don't know if people still say this when it comes to like learning how to be you know good at limited but it's like if you didn't if you don't attack and you don't block with a creature like you probably wasted what that creature's doing like it's there to do two things and if you're not attacking you're not blocking it had better have a reason and i think about that really often in terms of like okay do i attack with this creature and offer the trade or if my opponent's attacking with their creature of the same size am i not blocking because i'm afraid of a trick like what's what's the reasoning there and how does it play out and you can get a lot it only takes two people to really get a lot out of that because it is it is a pretty finite equation most of the time on on this board so even battle box type stuff, I right? Like that's what I was going to say. That's... Yeah, there's just like uh, I I always assume people don't have people local to them, but yeah, like that's a great point. If you have a roommate who plays Magic and y'all just go online and search up battle box or Tubert, that's aggressive, looks slanted. These sort of things can be great ways to practice as well, and maybe be even more engaging, quote unquote, than playing something like Mono White and you know Historic for five hours. I guarantee you Walmart has a jump start pack at your local Walmart. Like there, there are really good ways to engage in magic that don't have to be the competitive formats that will still teach you these things. And they can, you can do it really quick. So where should I start? If I already feel like I have strong fundamentals, Mason, I would first ask yourself the honest question. Do you really think you have strong fundamentals? This is the thing I sort of bring up a lot in coaching, right? And typically in coaching, it's an easy question to ask if someone's coming, but here's a question to ask yourself. If you have been doing it for a while and you haven't succeeded at your goals or come close to it, are you actually good at these things? 
right? And that is the first thing I think to do before you even sort of move on and talk about the rest of it. It's just like, all right, yes, there is some variance and you might not succeed. But if it's been a long enough time, you might want to ask yourself, am I attacking and blocking well? Do I understand mulliganing? Do I understand sideboarding, et cetera? And actually reflect on those things because, you know, there's a good chance you're probably not very good at it because it's really hard and very few people are really good at it. I watched players at Worlds play and talk about combat after the game because they were both like, yeah, I wasn't sure what was going on and what I should be doing. You know, and there's like shared camaraderie there or whatever at Worlds. And I don't know if you noticed in that story, I mentioned Worlds three times. You know, these are players who are playing Worlds. And there's players who, if I said their names, you would know who they are. And that's because it is really, really hard. So the first thing I would say is check yourself and assume you're worse at it than you think you are. That is just a good thing for most things in life, etc. After that, if you think you already have strong fundamentals and you're wanting to maybe reinforce them or improve or work on them, I would try to actually go about doing these things and recentering yourself and playing decks that force you to do things like this. An example of mulliganing and attacking and blocking, I think, is actually the Boros Convoke deck in Pioneer. If you want to focus in on both of those things, that deck forces you to understand sort of what role am I trying to take, what hands are actually people, how can I attack and block, and make sure you don't over sideboard to make sure your deck still functions. That sort of tests all those things. And you know, if you are really good at those things, you should be able to example 5-0 a league or come close to it playing those decks, right? I don't care how good you think the deck is in the metagame, you should be able to 5-0 a league if you take 10 shots with the deck. Like if you're good at these things, you'll just do it. So That is just something to think about. I'm curious how y'all might go about it. Abe, do you want to start off next? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, just just a a bit of an anecdote of probably the last time I realized I needed to check in on my fundamentals was the New Capenna Team Limited event at SCG Pittsburgh. And after, like, uh, the rounds finished up on Sunday, I got into a team draft with uh, Seth Manfield and some of his teammates from the event. And I remember I was playing against him and I had like a, a three one and he had a civil servant and I just tacked my three one to the civil servant instead of holding it back. Civil servant, the two, three, they can like gain life link and plus more so when they like tap a civilian to it. And he like paused for a second and raised his eyebrow a bit and then like took the three damage. And I immediately was like, Oh my God, this was a terrible attack because if he just plays a civilian, he gets the three life back. I'm taking three damage and I would have been better off blocking like doing nothing with my creature and directing the block. And I had to go back and think like, how long has this been a kind of attack that I've been willing to make, right? These fundamentals that I think are strong within myself. Like when is the last time I took the time to be like, okay, get into a situation and let's just talk through, verbalize my thought process on how it is I'm coming to my decision as opposed to just making the decision, right? So I can be like, okay, did I really consider this all the way? Or is the way that I've been evaluating these things that are normally second nature to me, am I not doing that in the way that is the best, right? Am I, do I have a leak here? And so I would say that if you feel like you already have strong fundamentals, challenge yourself to prove it to yourself, right? Or even prove it to, you know, someone else who you, you trust and also think is strong fundamentals, right? Talk through a situation where your fundamentals are going to be challenged, where that decision is going to come into play and test yourself on it to make sure that it's still where, you know, where you want it to be. And think about the last time maybe something was close and it didn't pan out and it might have been tied to your mulligan, your sideboard decision, your, you know, whether that attack was a good attack, the one that was, you know, you shoved with all your creatures and maybe it didn't go as well as you thought it would or you were playing to a draw that, you know, seemed like the right one at the time, go back and actually figure out whether or not it was the best at that moment in time and uh, why it is you made the decision you made and see if it actually is that strong. Because that's, it's so easy to lose track of it because there's so much, there are so many permutations of what it can be. You can't actually know what the right thing to do is off the top of your head every time without actually thinking about it a little bit. And, um, you know, even if you think you're good at it, you'd be surprised how easy it is to, to maybe make a mistake or two here or there. Yeah, I find myself doing this a lot is like a, a check-in um, and being really honest with yourself. But I think that there's a key to what we're saying here. And it's that we all do this <laughs> because it's important to do this. The number of times where I have left an event that I lost, where I was like, yeah, I made a bad Mulligan decision and I lost that event in the finals because I made a bad Mulligan decision. And it's like, oh, well, that was stupid. 
Why did you do that? Do you, you not discipline in mulliganing? Well, let's go work on that. Or uh, I made a bad, bad attack, or I made a bad block, or I mistapped my mana, or I uh, took two that I didn't need to take, or I missed two that I could have had. Those are all things that people say all the time that are convinced they have great fundamentals, like solid, unshakable fundamentals. Guess what? You don't. You just admitted you don't. So if you if you catch yourselves in those those moments like Abe described, or just just have a check in and go go work on it. Like I think some of the things that Smash has taught me, and the reason that I brought this team fundies thing from Smash to Magic, is that it is it is so boring sometimes. Think oh I have to go back to learning to attack and block. But you, the thing is, is you love magic. You're listening to a competitive magic podcast. You love magic. You're going, some of it will suck. And like, some of it's like, oh, uh, like, but find ways to make it fun for you. Find ways to uh, enjoy the fundamentals because the fundamentals of magic are fun. Like that's, it's a good game. Just quickly to what you said about, uh, I don't want to practice my thundies, but it's like fun. I think in, general most magic decks have something fun about them and saying that a deck isn't fun is typically like yes fun is subjective but there's probably something that is fun about that deck if you look into it and i would suggest trying to do that more and it's a little off topic but something i have been sort of banging the drum about recently is i'm really tired of hearing people say yeah that deck's great but i don't really find it fun and my main goal is winning but actually fun with my main goal i'm not honest with myself it's like all right we'll figure it out yeah i i completely agree uh I did streams a few years ago where I was like, I'm going to learn how to play aggro. I'm going to learn how, I mean, and I've, I've talked about this a lot where they like, I'm just going to jam aggro decks until I have a fundamental understanding of, of what's happening. I'm going to do this with control. I'm going to do this with ramp. I'm going to do this with all these archetypes that we've done all these episodes on. And what I find is I just enjoy magic a lot more now. Like a, like a lot more. Like magic is so freaking fun when you can pick up any deck you want. Yeah, I, I think the common thing you'll notice is that all of the good players never mention anything like I am an X player. And if you ask them in interviews, you're always feeling kind of laugh and say something like, you know, I kind of bias towards Jund or whatever. And there are exceptions that prove the rule right. But for the most part, if your main goal is winning, get over it and it's not like I'm asking you to go pull teeth. I'm asking you to play magic, which is pretty fun. Yeah, no, just on, on that topic specifically, I find it really funny that if I look at my three Pro Tour invites, the decks I've played, Rally the Ancestors, Four Color Sahili Cat Combo, Mono Green Devotion Pioneer, some of the other decks that I've played to a lot of success, Bant Company in the standard format that was like all Bant Company mirrors. And those tournaments, when I played those mirrors, I was like... Yeah, great. Awesome. Sick. We're both here doing it. You know, you find a way to appreciate it. And even today, especially with like Pioneer, people are like, oh, I don't know, all the decks suck. They're not fun. I'm like, I have a blast playing Mono Green, man. I, fi- I find a way to appreciate, find a way to appreciate just how that deck functions and making it all work. And it makes it so much more enjoyable. And and it doesn't have to be something that's not fun. You can you can really learn to learn to appreciate a lot of things we try so yeah i will say that a lot of people like you will come up to me because historically i didn't like modern like are you like a modern hater and i was like you know i think that when i learned to appreciate different styles of decks modern became more fun because even if the things that i love to do aren't good there's something fun to do uh and enjoy I, i've been really lucky right like recently in modern, but like right now, none of the decks that you would attribute to like a Spencer deck are good. And I think this modern format is pretty good. So Patreon question. If you want to become a patron of $5 or more, you get access to the discord where you too can ask a question. Big Dax Spencer said, so join the discord <laughs> is how they put their name in this red sheet. It says, how does one determine a reasonable deck for reasonable deck gaming trademark? Mason, I'm going to let you start. I think the biggest thing is just, is it an established deck that a lot of people are talking about and trying to beat? If people aren't talking about your deck in their cyborg guide in like the first five decks, probably not guaranteed it's a bad sign, but not great. For example, in modern, you know, four color bean, scam. That's like the first two, you know, like rhinos. There's other decks, right? But like we get down the line a little bit, 
it's a chance your deck is maybe not the best deck or a solid, you know, reasonable deck gamer by default if it isn't being talked about a lot. That is one way to decide it. The other is just having a good core game plan like we talked about in that episode. If you haven't heard that episode, I suggest going back and listening. It was about 10 weeks ago now. So I would say, yeah, go back and listen to the episode, but to determine if your deck is reasonable, no one should be surprised that you have said the deck name that you are saying, and all of the cards that you're playing should be ones that everyone would expect would be in the deck. This should be, this This is as close to what we call stock, right? You grab a deck list that has proven tournament success on Magic the Gathering Online, or in some paper, you know, um, what are they, uh, destination event of, of, you know, meaningful capacity, and you have perhaps copy pasted it, maybe changed a card or two, but not in anything that's outside of the norm for the archetype. We're really just, we're really just talking about showing up with something that's a known quantity. Uh, and, and if, if you're not doing something like that, then it might not be reasonable. Yeah. I, I think that the, the, the fundamental flaw that people have in this is that the way to do it is to just assume you're not the smartest person in the world. And then decide whether or not your deck choice is because you think that you're going to be the smartest person in the room. That's it. If you're like, ah, you know, most people don't know that this deck's like complete gas. It's like, ah, most people probably know that it's not, not complete gas. So, all right. If you want another way to have your question or thoughts or feelings answered on the show, uh, you can go to the YouTube comments or questions. You know, just leave a YouTube comment. It's a great way to do it. Uh, we had one this week that was, I remember, hashtag, would that be good from our bonus episode with Kyle Falbo? And no, I'm not bringing it back. Uh, that's literally what the YouTube comments are for. So that is going to do it. If you want to join the conversation, do so in those YouTube comments. Uh, head on to the Patreon and, or the public discords. Uh, Patreon discord is for $5 or more on Patreon. You will get a link in your welcome message letting you into the discord. Head on over to Twitter, at CCMTG. Uh, let us know what you think of the episode there. Share it with your friends. Uh, and then you can check out the rest of the network, which is right now just drafting archetypes. It's a great show, man. Like, I was listening to it this week. because so I, I saw the title, and I was like, what, what is this? It's like Rat Blast. I was like, all right, this is, this is the most Sam Black of Sam Black podcasts. I got to hear it. So I will say this format as well. Most draft, most like draft formats recently, they've been pretty good at like the color types working yeah. out, like the color pairs. This one, not quite the way it's panned out, which has made it so that having Sam as a resource to listen to and understanding a lot of like the weird things going on and kind of how the colors actually play out from his perspective is so so good. Like I, I would say, if you if you've been looking for reason to get into it and you like playing draft at all and you haven't, you just don't do podcasts like that, or you want to start getting into draft. It's so good. He, he's, he's so on the <laughs> It's so funny, too, because, like, you know, I'm, behind, I'm the behind-the-scenes production guy on the show, right? And so, like, I'm making the thumbnails, and I'm, like, posting the shows. And, like, we had one week where it was, like, these are the colors. And then every week since then, I'm like, what is the title of this episode? <laughs> so, uh, where can people find you, Mason? You find me over at twitch.tv slash the Mason Clark. You can find me at Twitter at Mason E. Clark. You can find me writing each and every week for card kingdom. You can reach out to me for coaching via my DMS on Twitter or at my email, Mason E. Clark at gmail.com. Abe, where can people find you? You can find me over at twitter.com slash more nothings. Um, you can also email me at more nothings at gmail.com for coaching or DM me on Twitter. Um, I do have uh, uh, one slot available on a weekly basis for anyone looking. So um, feel free to let me know. Uh, Spencer, how about you? Yeah, you can find me on X at Spencer 13 each. Uh, you can find me on blue sky. Same, same thing. Uh, and then you can find the podcast at CCMTG or CCMTG pod basically everywhere. You know, whether it's, you know, you want to see the, the short from this episode or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, the, those are the best places to find us. I am open to coaching again. Um, I uh, am willing to take about three people to start off, uh, see if I still want to do it. But it, I would appreciate it if it is just a listener of the show and we can sit down and uh, first sessions will be free. Just want to let you know. Mason, what did you learn on the show this week? 
that your first session of coaching is free. That's true. It's more of an interview. So it's like, if I want to work with you, so it's a little different. Hey, what'd you learn? On the I learned that Mason thinks that we did the, uh, the, the reasonable deck game. Episode. He said 10 weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Was There's it? no way it was 10 weeks ago, right? All right, I'm going to check right now. You keep talking, Spencer. Don't let the show end though, until I get there. <laughs> Don't let the show end. I, I, like, I like that you guys are like, you know, about something that somebody said, and mine's like how often we find ourselves in situations to, be, to go back to the basics, where uh, I almost think that if there's something I learned, it's that you should look for reasons to do this. You should look for reasons to do this, and you should... Like, if you're reviewing VODs of MTGO, like, be challenging yourselves on that while you're doing it. It's a way to, like, say, okay, to find those opportunities to review your fundamentals. I think that's the thing that I learned. Well, that'll do it for this week's fundamental episode of CCMTG. We'll see you all next week with a brand new episode of Constructed Criticism. It was 12 weeks ago. Oh, my God.